I taught myself to draw by copying the illustrations in my mother's and my grandmother's old books. I feel like I'm giving back to the horse community. I just love making these pieces. I believe fundamentally that art is supposed to be transformational. Today on Spotlight, celebrating women and their passions for art, like an ancient form of art from Navajo Indians called horsehair pottery. And then the Newbery Medal winner, Erin Entrada Kelly, talks about how she sees herself in her characters. Plus, legendary illustrator Mary Inglebright, how she came up with her world famous chair full of bullies. But first, meet the Repertory Theater's first female artistic director, why she wanted to work in St. Louis. It's Sunday, and you're watching Spotlight. At the Repertory Theater of St. Louis, you might say there is a new Sharif in town, Hana Sharif. After about 18 years on the East Coast, coming to the Midwest feels like a refreshing, new, exciting adventure. Starting at the end of this season, Sharif will become the rep's new artistic director, taking over from Steve Wolf, who is retiring after more than 30 years of building the rep into a regional theater with a national reputation. Could I leave you? Wolf is convinced he is leaving the leadership of the rep to exactly the right person. She is so generous and warm and smart about how she about how she sees art and 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 her and and how art is part of her life uh you you feel that right away and it's really important because this is about doing art you know on on the stage and I, you, you could feel that in the conversation with her and she laughs a lot <laughs> Since 2014, Hannah Sharif has been the Associate Artistic Director at Baltimore Center Stage. I knew the rep for its extraordinary production values and really interesting new voices that it was bringing to the stage. And I wanted to be in a city that I thought um, was interested in new voices and new ideas and in evolution. And um, it's been an extraordinary journey this far. When Hana Sharif takes over as artistic director at the Rep this June, she will become one of only a few women of color in the country and the first in St. Louis to run a large professional theater company. When the announcement was made, I was blown away by the warmth and the excitement all around the nation about what this appointment meant to people. Oh. Not negotiable. I realized that there are a multitude of expectations and hopes and dreams and that I cannot carry them all. That part of what I have to do is know that there are some people who will be disappointed and there are some people who will be overjoyed at my first season, but that ultimately I'm not here for one season. This is a long road. This is what matters right here. For institutions like ours uh, to keep it alive, that there, there are going to be some shifts. I think the overriding vision of the institution and what it is in the community and how it works, I don't think that's going to change. There'll be some programming shifts. I'm sure she's different. She sees the world different. She knows a cadre of writers that I don't know. She knows some younger writers, different artists that we all know. It will be an exciting time uh, for the community and for our audience to see what else is going on out there. I believe fundamentally that art is supposed to be transformational, that art has the ability to heal, it has the ability to allow us an access point, an entryway into difficult conversations. I mean, if you think about what we do, we bring together 600, 700 strangers into a space to have this communal experience that is also like completely unique and specific. Um, and I, I've said before that I've never encountered a human being that has come into an experience of really great art and not walked away changed by it. And that moment of transformation is what I look for. 
I love the classic American canon, and I love the new American canon. And I think that we will see during my tenure here both of those um, canons on stage and explored with as much passion and heart as possible. HEC Media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. In Erin and Trotta Kelly's magical new book, a young girl tests herself against impossible odds to help the people she loves. My books, I hope, the intention is that young people know that they don't have to be that other person. They don't have to fix something that's not broken. They just have to be the best versions of who they are. For the readers who see themselves in Lalani and the writer who created her, that gift is more valuable than the riches of the legendary mountain that lies beyond Lalani's island across the distant sea. So this is, it's a beautiful book. It's just so lyrical and... Thank you for that. Thank you. That's an incredible compliment. Tell us about Lalani and Lalani of the distant sea. When I sat down and set out to write this book, I thought I want to write um, a heroine who was like I was at 12. And what I mean by that is a lot of the heroes that we read about are they're destined from birth or they happen upon a rabbit hole or a door that takes them somewhere. And I wanted um, a character who was not particularly brave, was not particularly extraordinary in her village, just a very ordinary girl. and. That describes Lilani. How do you kind of come up with these beautiful lines while you're in there? It's For this book, it was a very different process because it is fantasy. I think for this particular one, um, it was about 15,000 words just of planning beforehand. And then once I have my notebook, because I write all my first drafts by hand, I just start writing. And whatever the manuscript calls for, whether it's uh, figurative language or um, not a lot of metaphorical language. It just kind of it happens and unfolds because I've spent so much time already with the world and the story before I ever start writing. So once I start writing, it's kind of, it's already there. It's just getting out of my head and onto the page. You post some of your notebooks on, on your website too. How did that start? Was that from the very beginning for you? Yes. So I started writing when I was about eight years old, when I was very little. and. Um, you know, I would read books and then I realized, oh, these are words on paper, so all I need is paper and words and then I can write my own books. Just started writing by putting pencil to paper and to this day that's how I, I start all my manuscripts. I feel like the more um, senses you engage when you're writing, uh, so the sight of the ink, I use different colors ink, uh, the smell of the paper and the ink and the feel of the pen on the paper and the sound of the paper turning. All those things I, I feel like make the process so much more personal. I feel like it's important to engage creativity whenever possible. So that's why I like to use different colored ink. Sometimes I'll turn the page a uh, different direction and write horizontally or write diagonally just to engage as much creativity as I can. This is also a beautiful book just as an object. The illustrations are gorgeous. How did all that come about? So I told my editor, I said, I really think this book needs interior illustrations because you have these little slices of second person narratives throughout the book. And they um, went on the hunt for an illustrator and they found Leanne Cho who illustrated the book. So she's very much a young up and coming illustrator and I, I know we'll see more from her because she's so incredibly talented. You seem so grateful for your life and what you're getting to do. It just comes across just a sort of level of joy and contentment that you are doing exactly what you feel like you were put here to do. Thank you for that. I, ho I hope it does come across because I am joyful and grateful and appreciative and I think about that little eight-year-old girl who you know, said one day I'm gonna write a bestseller and to think that that was my goal and now I'm out here, you know, that's why I love book signings so much with, with young people because I think someone actually has this book, especially when the kids, you sign it and a lot of kids will pick it up and they'll <laughs> hug it 
as they're walking away and they're so happy. And just to think, wow, my signature yeah, means something to someone that much. Um, I try never to lose sight of that and I, I don't, I hope I never do. You know, I never want to lose sight of how fortunate I am. Text Aaron to 31996 to watch the full interview or download our Talking with Authors podcast. Go to hecmedia.org for the arts and authors. Completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. Culture and community. It's considered to be the oldest organic farm west of the Mississippi. Science. I'm wearing 3D glasses, operating on a high-definition screen. And history. I was really blown away by the strategy that was used through the Underground Railroad. Education. I look forward to the day when they graduate high school. I want to be a part of that. Films. It's a long cost penny. Finding the coin places the site firmly in the 13th century. What's happening now around St. Louis and more. This is powerful, seeing my mother's story being told. Search all of HEC Media's award-winning content. HEC Media has earned the Mid-America Emmy Award for Overall Excellence four times. See for yourself at hecmedia.org. What she's given me is horse hair. The tail works the best. So we're going to pull out all that loose little stuff. And that's what we're going to use to burn on our pot. This is going to become the braid around it. Yeah. This is Odin. <laughs> this pot has been bisque fired. So it's hard. If I was a glaze person, this is when I'd put glaze on it. But I like to make things a little more natural. So we're going to heat this pot up to 1300 degrees. The origins of horsehair pottery is actually a Navajo technique. This is a very old art farm, but it's nice and warm coming out of there now. The legend goes a Navajo woman was bending over a pit because they would do pit firing and her hair caught on a piece of pottery and it made a great mark. And so they went and got some of their horse's hair, put it on there to empower their horses. It's right at 1400 degrees, so we're good. So let's go, take it out. If this was at night, you'd see this pot glowing. The heat is just blowing off of the top of it. Now this is a horse owner that's come to help. Too much wind. Yeah, go ahead and put yours on the inside. There we go. You come close. We gotta keep the wind off this pot. See it run? That's what we want. We want that run, and we want the smoke running up the pot. Pot's really hot, but it's cooling off real, real fast. See how I'm holding the, the, the horse here real loose? Because if I hold it straight, I'll get a straight line, but who wants a straight line? We want the kinks. See how it kinks up? That's what we're trying to get is that kink. So that pot is already cooled off. We want to leave some spots without horse hair. It's the, the contrast we're looking for. So this pot is basically finished. We will still, after it cools, knock off, see all this loose stuff, we'll knock that off, polish it up, and then we'll put a braid around it to show the, the true color of, of his hair. And this is from Odin's hair, so uh, Odin's name will be written on the bottom with my name because he's one of the artists. So that's a piece of pottery and it's, it's finished. My pottery is not mass produced. It's all handmade pieces. I hand throw all these pieces. You can actually even see my finger marks in the pieces of pottery. Even the shape of this. Look at the shape. It's, it's Mother Earth shaped. It's, it's got that fat, good Mother Earth feel. And, and that's what I want. I want my pots to feel earthy. This is a kind of a traditional Southwest squash pot. I did not invent this, this technique. And so I feel like I'm honoring the Navajo by using a shape that is a traditional shape. I just love making these pieces of pottery. This is what I do. 
It's rewarding for me. I feel like I'm giving back to the horse community and the horse community, I think, is getting something from these. I couldn't think of a better way to make my pottery. HEC Media presents Talking with Authors, the podcast. Your favorite writers and genres with diverse subjects and styles with new podcasts dropping bi-weekly. Subscribe to Talking with Authors wherever you get your podcasts. HEC Films. Explore. Inspire. Educate and entertain. HEC Films. Just one of the many facets of award-winning content you'll find at hecmedia.org. Celebrating women and their passions for art on Spotlight. Her style is unmistakable. Drawings of sweet-faced characters in brightly colored clothing with a vintage look about them and cute witty captions on cards, calendars, and in books. I've always had that kind of look, and, and I think it's because I taught myself to draw by copying the illustrations in my mother's and my grandmother's old books from when they were children. So I think the drawings look a lot uh, like 1920s, 1930s drawings. And then, of course, there's perhaps Mary Englebright's most famous drawing. Life is Just a Tear of Bullies came about because I was dating a boy here in St. Louis, and his father was mad at his older brother. And we were in one room, and we could hear him kind of, you know, yelling at the brother. And, of course, he meant to say life is not a bowl of cherries, but he said life is not a chair of bullies. And so I immediately went and illustrated it. I thought it was great. I mean, the picture just popped into my head the minute he said it. Growing up here in St. Louis, Mary never had any formal art training. I did not go to art school. I, frankly, couldn't wait to get out of school and start to work. But Mary had talent and ambition and started working as a professional artist while she was still in high school. I illustrated a lot of songs that were popular, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and Johnny Mitchell, and things like that. I would illustrate lines from those songs. It's totally illegal. But um, I would do that, and the store owner would call and say, well, I need three dozen cards, I need four dozen cards, and I'd, I'd just sit down and draw and sell them to her for... Started out 25 cents a piece, and she'd pay me, uh, she would charge 50, and then we upped it to 50 cents a piece, and she would charge a dollar. She jokes that her style hasn't changed much since those days, but one thing that has changed is the subject matter of her work, which now often has an edgier, sometimes political message. I've always been left leaning. Definitely, Michael Brown broke my heart, and I thought, you know, I have a voice, however big or small it is, I have a little voice and I need to say something about this. I had been doing this for a long time and I had reached a point where I thought, you know, if it hurts the business, it hurts the business, I don't, I'm fine. So I did it. I certainly heard from some people who were not happy and who unfollowed me, but actually we gained about three times as many families, which gave me so much hope. That you know, people were basically good and wanted to do the right thing. Mary's gone on to create more pieces with social justice messages, ranging from race and religious equality to women's rights. She started a new line of black and white cards with a slightly darker, more sarcastic tone she refers to as her Mary Angle Dark collection. But that doesn't mean she's any less optimistic or gets any less enjoyment from her work. I don't look at the cards I do and the posters I do as a business. And that is the business part of my life, and then there's the family part of my life and the friends part of my life. It's all rolled in together. My art is part of my life, so I express what I believe in it. And those things are important to me, so, you know, it comes out in the art. Cheer Bullies is definitely emblematic of the, my career. But I tend to like the drawing I'm working on right at the moment. Happening now, only one more week to see the Orchid Show at the Botanical Garden. This once-a-year collection ends March 22nd. Step inside the Sheldon and one of their six art galleries, from works by an architect to rare African instruments. See this full story and more at hecmedia.org. Or satisfy your sweet tooth with cookies designed by a real artist. Here's more.
At Colleen's in Clayton, it is always crunch time. I can do anything from a dozen to like 500 in one day. Sarah Walter is Colleen's decorator in chief, creating designs that are anything but cookie cutter. It's hard to keep from eating all the cookies. I have to sample everything though, so quality control. Although many of her creations are sold in boxes, Sarah tries to think out of the box. And if she makes a mistake, she gets to eat it, right? No, <laughs> of course not. That's how you gain weight. Sarah is not the only artist in Colleen's kitchen, and cookies are not her only works of art. Her first love is painting. This one seemed especially appropriate to hang in the cafe. Some of Sarah's other paintings run from warm and fuzzy to dark and scary. I love Halloween things, anything creepy. <laughs> yes, it is consumed, and sometimes that is a good thing, and sometimes you like feel really sad about it. If you work so long on a cookie, and you'll never see it again. I did a, a birthday cake for uh, someone, and it was the Death Star from Star Wars, and I made it very three-dimensional, and it had glitter on it, and it looked so good, and I was like, I'm sad to part with this. <laughs> Some little kid's gonna eat this. They can make just about anything a customer wants, but sometimes there's no accounting for taste. There was one order we did where they wanted like part of a leg, but with like an argyle sock on it. I don't know what party that was for. I know people that have saved cookies for years because they're so beautiful they don't want to eat them. One I know is in a uh, china cabinet. It's been in there for years, and I'm like, we could make you another one of those. <laughs> Sarah is not sure how long she'll continue making edible art, but it keeps her from being a starving artist. All in all, it's a pretty sweet job. I'll probably continue for a few more years. I keep saying every year, and it's usually around Christmas time when we have all those big orders. I'm like, I'm not doing this next year. It's too stressful, but here I am. <laughs> it's a pretty neat job. On stage this week in St. Louis, Clayton Community Theater tells the story of an East Coast socialite trying to get remarried with the Philip Berry play, The Philadelphia Story. The Kirkwood Theater Guild visits the idyllic summer home of a family trying to reconcile strained relationships in On Golden Pond. KTK Productions has a musical mashup of Shakespeare-infused stagecraft and rock and roll in the form of Return to the Forbidden Planet. And the Rep Studio Series will mount a play about much more than baking, The Cake. Reviews for these shows and more at hecmedia.org. Do you like local theater? Then watch our show, Two on the Isle. See video theater and opera reviews by the veteran duo of Bob Wilcox and Jerry Kowarski anytime on YouTube, Facebook, and HEC Media. Just Google Two on the Isle. family. My mother was a jazz singer and I remember her coming home late night and bringing home a wad of cash from uh, from singing and I thought that was such a great accomplishment of hers uh, to be able to make money uh, doing music and my grandmother she was a pianist and she was a, a music teacher and my grandfather was a jazz saxophonist. When I was little my grandmother would play jazz as she would drive me to school and she would say, what instrument is that? And I'm like, uh, clarinet, a saxophone, and until I got it right. So I kind of grew up in jazz, and I love jazz. And um, it's the jazz inspiration is prevalent in my music, but I also have inspirations from rock and pop and R&B and soul and pretty much all over. Back then, I was a jazz singer, and uh, my name was Leah. And that's my middle name, and I've evolved into Bloom. To be completely honest, the name Bloom came from me in a dream, and I woke up just like this and said, Bloom. <laughs> and I, I was singing a song in my head in the dream, or I sing a lot in my dreams, and I've been trying to figure out my name for forever. And after I came up with the name is then when I um, came up with the meaning. Bloom, for me, is 
It's very symbolic of me breaking out and being confident and comfortable with who I am and taking all of my in influences and inspirations and making them my own. When I look into your eyes and I I've been writing music since the age of 13. I got a MacBook uh, by my grandmother for school, <laughs> and I discovered GarageBand. Eventually, throughout the years, I heard entire songs in my head. So I had like hundreds and hundreds of songs on my computer and nobody to help me produce them. My musical journey as Bloom started about a year ago. And I had a big afro, and I was singing at an open mic. I was singing a Jill Scott song, and my sister signed me up, and I didn't want to sing. And so I get up there, and I have my big fro. I take my shoes off. I walk down this aisle and started singing, and I had my arms out, and I was just really being myself. And that was one of the first moments I really was myself completely as a singer, and um, I didn't care. Uh, and from then on, things just started rolling. And then I met a producer, and that didn't work out, but I met another producer, and we started recording songs that I had written probably a year before that, but I had no one to help me with them. And those actually were my two first singles that I ever um, came out with. I believe that we can do it twice. It's really important that I write all of my music. If I didn't write the music, I would feel like there was a piece missing. So I'll step away from whatever I'm doing, I'll hear this melody, I'll record it in my phone, and eventually it becomes a song. When I sing and perform, my goal is to inspire people to think a little bit deeper. My music might be about one thing, but for me, Becoming a singer is becoming who I am and saying I don't care anymore and I and I want to live out my purpose. So I want that to kind of pour over onto other people and inspire them to feel the same way because for me singing was such a hard thing to do. I was really insecure and I think a lot of us go through that growing up and it's okay but it's important to grow out of that. So when I sing, I want people to grow out of that. I want them to be inspired by someone who was so afraid in the beginning and now is successful and happy doing the same thing she was afraid to do before. It's, it's my biggest passion. It's what I came here to do. And it's been a really, really beautiful journey. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. as we welcome in spring.